Good morning, glad to be here. After dinner last night, I feel like I know many of you very intimately. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was a very enjoyable dinner. Uh, Bill had us talk about personal experiences that got us into this movement. And some of those stories began from the womb, I may add. So it was, it was quite an interesting dinner. Um, through this weekend, everyone ha has expressed their own priorities when it comes to trying to address corporate involvement in politics. Uh, you know, some priorities focus on, sorry, trying to keep track of my time. Some priorities focus on taxes, energy, climate change, uh, food quality, uh, land resource management. Everyone has their own priority of what they're focusing on. And, and they're all noble, great priorities. I want to emphasize, though, that underlying each of these priorities is the process, the money and politics aspect, the campaign finance angle, as well as the lobbying expenditure angle, that ultimately determines the conditions that will directly affect uh, the outcomes of those priorities. So, you know, whatever your priority is, you've got to pay attention also to the money in politics and, and you know, how that money is going to determine who's going to be in our elected agencies determining our priority outcomes. Um, there is, I'm going to focus mostly on the issue of transparency, just to try to keep, uh, you know, my presentation within reasonable time periods here. Uh, so transparency, by the way, is the most basic fundamental element of money in politics. I am a firm believer in having strong regulations, contribution limits, spending limits, and you know everything else, but it's transparency that is the base upon which the rest of the house is built when it comes to dealing with campaign finance and lobby reform. So this is the most fundamental thing. And we're talking, I want to emphasize, two sides of the same coin. One side is campaign finance, and the other side that often tends to be too ignored is lobbying expenditures. You know, in, in many jurisdictions, including in the U.S. until 2012, more money is spent by corporations on lobbying than is spent on campaign finance. So don't ignore that other side of the coin. Let me talk about campaign finance first, since that is really on the minds, I think, of, of most people, and, and appropriately so. In the United States, we have had decades of achievement when it comes to campaign finance regulation, especially in terms of transparency. We had reached, after the McCain-Feingold bill was passed in 2002, literally 100% donor disclosure. We knew where all the money was coming from, just about all the money that was flowing into campaigns and elections from candidates, parties, and most importantly, outside groups. And I know from, from what I've been learning over the weekend, outside groups are becoming a big phenomenon in Alberta as well when it comes to campaign finance issues. Uh, we really start, if I can do this correctly, not quite. There we go. We really start, believe it or not, from this simple position of defining what is a campaign ad. This is what affects most directly outside advertisers, outside groups that get involved in campaigns. When it comes to disclosure of candidates and political parties, you can assume just about everything they do is campaign oriented, and so that tends to be subject to disclosure. It's these outside groups that are the mysterious groups that are the difficult ones to capture in which you have to make sure you come out with a very clear definition of what is a campaign ad. We were doing it well back in the U.S. Then came along the Roberts Court, our Supreme Court. It, you know, in 2009, when President Obama took over uh, the White House, there was a ceremony on Cap at the Capitol, my office is right next to the Capitol, where George Bush flew away in a helicopter. I went on the roof of my building to wave goodbye. You know, goodbye, George. 
let's, let's see if we can get back to some sort of reasonable <coughs> policies here in the US. I forgot that before he left, he appointed two new justices to the Supreme Court, Roberts and Alito. And I forgot what kind of impact that can have. It has, it has been devastating uh, when it comes to campaign finance. Literally last week, we just had another decision by the Supreme Court, the McCutcheon decision, which you know some of you may or may not have heard of, but it shows that those five justices now, uh, the Supreme Court's nine justices, but the conservatives, and, and they're not just conservatives, the, liberal, the Supreme Court's never been progressive, but now we have five justices that really are corporatists, not just conservative, but corporatists, uh, with the new two, uh, two new Bush appointees, and you know they have ruled remarkably, uh, you know, striking down our campaign finance laws and our disclosure laws as well. So, if you are to get any lessons from what I'm about to talk about in the U.S. experience, keep in mind I'm talking about what we once had. Uh, don't look to what the U.S. offers right now as anything that can, that can provide lessons for you. But we once had a good system. By the way, I do believe we're going to get back to uh, what we once had. Uh, it's going to take some work, but we are, we are busy doing this. Larry wanted me to tell you a story about some mobilizing we had done on the McCutcheon decision, so this might be a good time on this. Uh, you know, we knew the five justices, and I call them the five horsemen of the apocalypse. We, we knew the five justices were going to come out with a ruling on McCutcheon striking down aggregate contribution limits. Uh, we just didn't know when. And this was about, oh, four or five months ago. So we organized what we called a, you know, a series of 140 demonstrations in 41 states to protest on the day the McCutcheon decision came out. Now, we did not know what day that's going to be. So what we did is we set up a web page, and you should check this out. It's Money Out, Voters In. Money Out, Voters In. And on that web page, we solicited activists from all across the country to agree to participate in a demonstration that's going to occur on the day of the McCutcheon decision. We didn't know that day, but what we did is we set up places where the demonstrations are going to be, the time the demonstration is going to happen, and then got the emails and other contact information of everyone who agreed to participate in these demonstrations so we can notify them the morning the decision comes out. And literally, it worked. I mean, we had demonstrations all across the country that very same day, which served, and, and by the way, just to make sure these demonstrations really happened and that everyone knew how meaningful they were, we asked everyone to take pictures of each of the demonstrations. So if you go on our webpage that uh, Money Out Voters In, you'll see pictures of all 140 demonstrations happening, you know, all around the country. And the purpose was to mobilize, first of all, opposition to the, uh, the five horsemen and their decisions, uh, you know, potentially applying pressure on them not to go any further, showing how much America objects. But even more so, we're running a constitutional amendment campaign, and you can imagine how difficult that is. This has given us a huge boost on, on that campaign, and so it helps mobilize that, that whole drive. And furthermore, it just gets all of America more educated and involved into what's going on. We got so much local news coverage of how bad the McCutcheon decision is, uh, there aren't a whole lot of people around, uh, around the US at this point who are unaware of it. So a very successful mobilizing effort. We lost the decision, but uh, we're, ready. we're ready to move forward from there on. Getting back to what is a campaign ad. You know, in the U.S. back in 1976, the Supreme Court struggled with this issue and came out in the Buckley decision saying, okay, you can only apply transparency requirements or other campaign finance regulations to campaign ads. You can't apply them to issue ads. 
that don't, aren't designed to affect the election of candidates. You know, so no regulation, no transparency there, only for campaign ads. And then they came out in, in a footnote in the Supreme Court decision, footnote 52, saying, okay, a campaign ad is, I guess, if it uses one of eight magic words, saying vote for, vote against, elect, something like that. That's a campaign ad. So the magic word standard was our standard. That meant if any ad did not use the magic words, it could be financed by corporate money and it was not subject to disclosure. Well, no one really knew what was going on because we had no disclosure of these ads. So back in 2000, I participated in a study called uh, the Buying Time Study. This is what we were trying to deal with. This is the type of ad that took place in 2000. You don't really have to be able to read the prints, but you, you can get the gist of it. I mean, here it's talking about um, essentially the Al Gore, if Al Gore were elected, basically, it, you know, it, doesn't, it never uses the term election. It just says Al Gore has sought these policies that are going to make America result in a nuclear war. You know? So it doesn't say elect, it doesn't say vote for. It just basically says Al Gore, nuclear war. You know, and that's the gist. And so this is the type of ad that fell outside the campaign finance regulation. There was another one too that relates to some priorities here. There was in, in 2000, in the Republican primary, John McCain was running against George Bush. And suddenly these outside ads swept the airwaves, uh, sponsored by a group called Republicans for Clean Air. Republicans for Clean Air. Now this ad talked about how George Bush has promoted all kinds of pro-environmental regulations. He's reining in, uh, you know, uh, air pollution. He's going to clean up the air. It ends looking forward for a clean environment with George Bush. <laughs> no one knew who this group was. You know, people were wondering, is this the Sierra Club? No one knew because it wasn't, it wasn't disclosed. The Sierra Club said, of course it's not us, you know. <laughs> it was only after the ad worked and got George Bush the nomination that uh, then one of the sponsors came out and boasted, you know, hey, you know, we're the Wiley Brothers and we financed it. The Wiley Brothers are an, an oil industry executive. So it was an oil company that paid for that ad. So we had to do something about it. We went into setting up a, a study called the Buying Time Study. This was a joint effort with New York University and Brigham Young University and the University of Wisconsin. What we did, essentially, there's this old Navy satellite flying around in space that used to spy on Soviet submarines during the Cold War. You know, now the Cold War is over, it's just flying around there. It's not doing anything. So we rented that satellite to monitor television commercials in the 2000 elections. We sucked in all these television commercials and then had students at all those three universities sit there and actually have to view those commercials and then fill out a survey on it. You know, first of all, uh, you know, uh, it, did the ad use any of the magic words, for instance, uh, which is very straightforward. We had one subjective question in there, and that is, does, is this ad designed to influence how you're going to vote for or against a candidate? So that was the one subjective answer. What we found was really fascinating. The, these are issue ads or ads sponsored by outside groups. The dotted line were coded by the students as being genuine issue ads, not designed to influence the election of candidates. The solid line is uh, issue ads that are designed to influence the election of candidates. And what we were doing was working for the McCain-Feingold law to come up with a new definition of campaign ad as any ad that mentions a candidate, targets that candidate's constituency, and airs within 60 days of the election. 
Take a look at that solid line. That's all within that 60-day period. I mean, this is when outside groups want to advertise for or against candidates. They may not use the magic words, but clearly this is what they're designed to do. I would be producing these types of results and then email them instantly to the Senate floor where Senator Collins or uh, Senator Snow would then take these charts because the McCain-Feingold law at that point was stuck in the Senate at, at that point. We were unable to get it through. And I'd be watching on C-SPAN right after I would email this type of chart. And I'd see on C-SPAN literally 30 minutes later my chart coming out you know, on the Senate floor showing what's going on here. And that was enough to help push the law through. We got McCain-Feingold approved in 2002, and we went to a 100% disclosure at that point in 2004 and the 2006 elections. Now, to get good transparency, I want to emphasize some other aspects. Not only do you define when, uh, what a campaign ad is very clearly, and by the way, this is relevant to Alberta, I, I notice there have been some new changes in the Alberta campaign finance law. But also, you've got to have instant or at least real-time reporting as to w uh, when the financing of these ads takes place. In the United States, for instance, I mean, quite frankly, with the internet available, there's no excuse not to have instant reporting of campaign finance laws and campaign finance uh, camp expenditures. No excuse for it. Uh, in the U.S., you know, we have candidate disclosure is essentially on a quarterly basis until you get within that election cycle. Then we, we require 48 hours. Every 48 hours, a candidate has to report their sources of income and their expenditures. When it comes to parties, it's monthly, and then they also have to file a report 12 days before the election. When it comes to those outside groups, we require them to report every 48 hours uh, through the course of the election, when they make expenditures of $10,000 or more, and then when it gets within 20 days of the election, we require 24-hour disclosure of every $1,000 expenditure. And this is not an enormous burden. I mean, with the internet, it's all easily done. And, uh, and this provides real-time information. It's important that you have real-time information. Otherwise, if you're gonna rely upon, you know, uh, for instance, like in Alberta, where the campaign finance reports come out four months or six months after the election. You know, what's the point? You know, it, it's like, I don't know, almost like teasing you. It's, you know, you're given information six months later as to uh, the oil companies financing an ad for, you know, clean environment, and you go, oh my gosh, I guess six months ago I should have changed my vote. You know, you've got to know beforehand who is behind financing these types of ads? Post-election disclosure is really quite useless. To get on a little more, we've had a big problem in the U.S., and that's the five horsemen. Uh, they have been whittling away at our campaign finance laws. You know, most remarkably, uh, back in January 21, 2010, and we were not prepared for this one, uh, it came out the Citizens United versus FEC decision. Citizens United, these same five justices had ruled that corporations are to be treated as persons, people, under the First Amendment, and therefore can make unlimited campaign expenditures. We had a hundred year history at the federal level of not allowing corporations to get directly involved in campaigns which grew out of the whole robber baron corruption era, which I won't get into. But, you know, for a hundred years, we had prohibited corporate involvement. And then suddenly these five justices decide, well, corporations are people too. So uh, let them get involved. The immediate impact, if you take a look at that red line, the second to the last red line, 
there was a 420% increase in outside spending in the 2010 elections immediately following Citizens United over the previous congressional election, the other red line over there, a 427% increase. And that was just corporations dipping their toes in the political water saying, can we really do this? You know, can we do this and, and get away with uh, not really being subject to disclosure too? And they realized they could. So when 2012 came around, we saw another fourfold increase. This is like corporations running amok in federal elections in the US because of that Citizens United decision. And we've been losing disclosure. We had that 100% disclosure originally. It's now dropped to about 50% and is dropping even further. And the reason being, and this is relevant to Alberta, is our disclosure law it wasn't intended to allow a loophole, but the courts have decided that it does. And that is we write, we have written in the law that if the campaign contribution is given for the purpose of, of supporting a campaign ad, it's subject to disclosure. Well, no one really says when they hand over a campaign check, the purpose is to finance a campaign ad. I mean, you just hand over a campaign check because you believe in, in the cause and you, know, you let the candidate or the outside group do whatever they want with it. That should be subject to disclosure. We have since, or the courts have since, decided that the for purpose clause means that if no one actually earmarks the money as to how it's gonna be used, they don't have to be subject to disclosure. So we've been losing disclosure steadily over the times. That raises particular issues of the problems with Alberta's campaign finance law. One, first of all, post-election reports. Good grief. I mean, that's not what voters need. Voters need to know who's financing an election before they walk into the poll. And so you can decide and you can judge the merits of those campaign ads. If you knew, that, if we had known, that the Republicans for Clean Air ad was financed by the oil industry, it would have had a whole different impact than, than the post-election knowledge that the oil companies finance those ads. You've got to know before the election, not after the election. And I want to emphasize, in this age of the internet, there's no excuse to have post-election reporting and not pre-election reporting. Uh, secondly, the Alberta law requires fairly limited financial data. Uh, first of all, there's no itemized expenditure data, so you don't really know how much money is going to fundraising versus ads versus administrative costs. I just ran into a committee in the US that was set up to finance elections for vets, and being able to run over the itemized expenditure data, I noticed that only 5% of all the money was spent to support vets. Literally 95% was used for administrative expenses, which, you know, obviously leads to fraud. And there may be cases like that in Alberta. You're not gonna know that unless you have itemized financial disclosure. Secondly, when it comes to donor disclosure, you know, I, I looked at the Alberta disclosure list and the post-election reports, and they just list names as to where the money came from. If you don't have occupation and employer tied with those names, you're not gonna know who they are. I mean, they're just a bunch of people, uh, you know, or maybe corporations that gave money. You gotta know who those people are tied to. Are they tied to the oil industry? Are they tied to environmental groups? Uh, you know, who, who's their employer? That's, that's the critical information, much more so than the individual names. And perhaps worse, is the data is not what I call searchable, sortable, and downloadable. That's a term I coined, by the way. And I, I put that in Loga. Uh, I'll get to that a little later. Um, uh, searchable, sortable, and downloadable. If you can't take a look at the database and actually search by certain criteria or sorts by who gave the biggest contributions, or even download the data into your own database so you can do your own analysis. You're just looking at 
pictures. You know, I'll, I'll get to that a little later when I talk about lobbying activity. Um, the third, uh, the fourth thing, the poor third-party disclosure. First of all, most importantly, the disclosures are only post-election, so you're not going to be able to judge the merits of any of these outside ads when you vote. Uh, secondly, the definition of ads that I notice in the Alberta law is interesting. It, it has a very subjective definition. It, it says if an ad promotes or opposes a candidate or party, then it's subject to disclosure. That's not so bad, except it leaves it entirely up to the electoral officer to determine whether or not the ad is supporting or opposing a candidate. Is that ad, or, or another ad that I saw in the 2000 elections, for instance, of, was a judicial candidate, and the judge had, had provided an easy sentence for someone who was convicted of, of being a pedophile. Well, this outside group, you know, didn't really get into the details. It just pictured the judicial candidate and on his forehead put pedophile, you know, and didn't say vote for or vote against. If an ad were aired like that in Alberta, would that be supporting or opposing a candidate? It's questionable. It's entirely up to the discretion of the electoral officer. And so perhaps a clearer definition should, should be proposed. And also the donor disclosure law in Alberta also uses that phrase for the purpose of. If you gave the contribution for the purpose of a campaign ad, you're subject to disclosure. Get rid of that sort of, uh, you know, subjective uh, you know, statement. If you just gave a, an ad, I mean, a contribution to one of these groups, you should be subject to disclosure. I know I'm kind of running out of time, but I really want to get to the other side of the coin of lobby disclosure, and I'll try doing this sort of quickly. Uh, a good disclosure, uh, lobby disclosure, by the way, uh, a good system, first of all, has to be mandatory, not voluntary. I know that's not a problem here in Alberta. But out in Europe, I'm having a hard time with uh, the European, European Union. They keep wanting to go with these voluntary disclosure systems. You know what I'm saying? If you do that, you're going to miss the people that you most need to have disclosed. Uh, you know, we have a history of that in the U.S. Uh, we originally <clears throat> had a lobby disclosure law on the books since World War II. FDR believed that Adolf Hitler was lobbying the U.S. to keep us out of World War II. And so he passed the first lobby disclosure law and, you know, said if your primary purpose is lobbying Congress, you have to disclose. Well, that primary purpose standard is so subjective, you know, everyone determines what their own primary purpose is. Lawyers, it's being a lawyer, not, not a lobbyist. Adolf Hitler never registered. So he never disclosed anything. So finally, in 1995, we came up with a better law that provided empirical three thresholds mandating disclosure. If you made two lobby contacts or more, you uh, received $3,000 or more in compensation, and you spent 20% of your time preparing for those lobby contacts, you were subject to disclosure. We immediately saw a tenfold increase in lobby disclosures once we pass this law. So, secondly, a good lobby disclosure law has to focus on the money. The money is where the corruption lies. It's not just the people or the clients, it's the money. How much money is being spent? How much money is a certain industry investing? So it isn't just who, but it's actually how much. Focus on the money on a good lobby disclosure law. Third, electronic filing and disclosure. Um, actually, I'll get to that later, but you need to have, in order to have a searchable, sortable, downloadable database, you have to have electronic filing and disclosure. In Alberta, it's like what we used to have in the U.S. until the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, and that is lobbyists, we all have all our financial records and our client records on computer form, you know, and then what we would do is we print it out in paper, and then hand it over to Pam Gavin at the Secretary of the Senate, these paper forms. So she'd take literally a stack of paper forms 12 feet high and try scanning them into PDFs and then post the PDFs online. Well, PDFs, first of all, are expensive. Secondly, 
They're just paper, except they're on, on a web page. You can't really search them very well. I remember working with the European Union with a group out there called Alter EU, and they thought the US had a great lobby disclosure system because Pam Gavin, bless her heart, entirely on her own, you know, would post these paper forms on PDF on the web page. And they thought it was excellent. So they were showing some European commissioners what a great system the US has. And they decided to show them, they got them together in a room with computers, you know, and typed in National Rifle Association. Nothing showed up. They type in NRA, nothing showed up. I get an emergency call from Brussels, say, what's going on? We can't find NRA and we've got these commissioners sitting here with us. You know, I explained on it with a PDF, you've got to type in exactly how it was uploaded. And for NRA, they uploaded it as Natal Rifle Ass. So that's how you find them. We changed that on, in LOGA, the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act. Uh, that was in 2007. A great story behind that, but I'm going to skip over that. Uh, of the many things we did, we mandated electronic filing. We mandated electronic disclosure in a searchable, sortable, and downloadable format. If you require electronic filing, it's going to be digital filing. So with digital filing, you can set up searchable, sortable, and downloadable because it's no longer just pictures you're dealing with anymore. You know, I wrote that clause in the law, and I had, after we passed it, Pam called, and you know, she's charged with implementing the law. She says, Craig, what do you really mean by searchable, sortable, and downloadable? Tell the truth, Pam, I just sort of have this obscure notion of what it is. I'll leave it up to you to figure out how to do it. And she did a very good job at it, by the way. You, if you check out our LDA uh, database, you can see how good it is. We also require disclosure every three months to make sure we have real-time disclosure. When you take a look at Alberta, there are some interesting shortcomings. One, the definition of lobbyists is 100 hours of lobbying contact. You know, to tell the truth, I don't know in my experience, of any lobbyist in the U.S. who spends 100 hours face-to-face -face with a lawmaker. I mean, most of our time is spent preparing for those lobby contacts, doing the research, you know, setting up the meetings, uh, you know, preparing for the whole, whole thing. Uh, we don't really spend 100 hours sitting there face-to-face. You're lucky to get face-to-face -face meetings, and they're usually quite short, 15 or 30 minutes, you know, at most. So that would seem to be a huge loophole for anyone who actually wanted to use it. Secondly, and most importantly, and I, I repeat this over and over and over, there are, there's no financial disclosure in the lobby law in Alberta. You know, it's, of course it's useful to know who the clients are and who the lobbyists are, but if you don't know where the money's coming from, that's the, that's the source of corruption. That's what you have to know. You've got to follow the money to track which corporations are actually having, exerting disproportionate influence over which lawmakers. You need to have that. And it should be real-time disclosure. Uh, you know, currently in Alberta, it's like semi-annual filings by the lobbyists. You've got to have closer to real-time disclosure. You know, at the national level in Canada, they do have real-time disclosure. And finally, it can't be PDFs that you just file because you need to set up a searchable, sortable, downloadable database. So to conclude, when it comes to campaign finance, it determines, and lobby finance, both those sides of the coin determine the prospects for all of you pursuing your own priorities. You've got to have transparency of the money in politics. You've got to be able to follow the money. And you've got to be able to follow the money in real time, before the election happens, before Parliament or Congress decides on a legislation. You've got to know beforehand so you have the information to act accordingly. And 
once again, I want to really emphasize, in the age of the internet, there's absolutely no excuse for not having real-time disclosure and full disclosure of where the money is. Uh, these are some of the improvements I'd like to see happen in Alberta and bring back in the U.S. Thanks. Um, Craig has uh, provided lots of time for some dialogue here. Uh, Bill Moore Kilgannon, I think, um, is uh, about to, uh, yeah, or, yeah, okay, good. Uh, we have two mics. Um, by the way, um, Craig sees the big picture of democracy and corporatism He's focused on the campaign finance and the lobbying here, but if you want to put those in the context or raise other aspects of this um, democracy and corporatism uh, connection, uh, feel free to do so, all right? So whatever kind of questions you have for him, that'd be great. Uh, I see a hand over here. Is it easier for you to just be up here? Sure. Unless you wanna. No, 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 that, that's good. Hello there, I'm Mary Dar from Grand Prairie. And I just wondered uh, if you could talk about how it's being used as a tax deduction. I know when I see a big corporation, uh, you know, people with a lot of money uh, donating money for campaigns, I think, well, I'm paying for that. You know, so I'd just like you to comment on that. On essentially the size of contributions? Yeah, or how, like in, in Alberta, you can get sometimes 75% of your money back as a tax deduction, so. Oh, you're talking about tax deductions? Yeah, oh. yeah, I just wondered, like, that big line of corporate, is, is, is some of that is used as a tax write-off, or? Uh, you know, when it comes to Canadian law, uh, you folks would be better experts on whether there is a permissible tax deduction. I can tell you about U.S. law, and there is no tax deduction provided for a campaign contribution. Uh, so uh, you can make a campaign contribution, but you can't deduct it on your taxes, except if you do it through one of these shadowy outside groups. So, for instance, the Chamber of Commerce is one of these shadowy outside groups that doesn't disclose where their money comes from. A corporation that makes a, uh, pays dues, for instance, to the Chamber of Commerce is allowed to take a business deduction for those dues if it is assumed that the dues are being used for educational purposes for the chamber. Now the chamber can use that money for any purpose it wants and it spends heavily on electioneering. It's one of the big nonprofit electioneering groups. So much of that money is being used for electioneering and companies are taking some tax deductions on that. So in the US, you can do it through one of the shadowy groups but directly to a candidate or a committee uh, a tax deduction is not allowed. Uh, I would, I, I don't know Canada law, so I, I, I don't want to pretend I'm an expert on that. Well, there, there is a campaign contribution deduction that they can get as well, but also these 400 or $500 a plate dinners often are written off as business expenses as well, so you're right, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all paying for their contributions one way or the other. Carol Wodak, and you're about to hear my Sunday morning rant. And that's about shadowy groups. And I know because I made submissions when they brought in the Lobbying Act here, and I discovered that there was a huge lobbying effort about that from the volunteer sector to exclude any nonprofit organizations from the restrictions of the Lobbyist Act. So they don't have to report, they don't have to do anything. And the interesting thing... Are you talking about in Alberta? In okay. Alberta. Yeah. Okay. The interesting thing is that in Alberta, a lot of the corporatization of the seniors' care has been fronted by our sainted not-for-profit organizations. 
And there is no difference, for instance, between extended care and the Good Samaritan Society and how they work, where they spend their money, or anything else. But it's those groups that lobby the government for increased fees, for reduced services, for not having nurses on the floor, and so on. So we really do need to tighten things up and understand where the money comes from and where it goes. I, I, you know, even though that wasn't a question, I, I do want to uh, highlight this point. This does, this does point out that there is a problem going on in Alberta when it comes to nonprofit groups, both in terms of lobbying and I suspect in terms of campaign finance ads as well. Uh, you know, I, I know the new Alberta campaign finance law affecting outside groups requiring them to disclose if they're supporting or opposing a candidate is new. So there is no real means yet of determining is the electoral officer actually enforcing that law, interpreting it properly or not. However, what I did notice is that there have been no legal complaints yet filed by the electoral officer against any nonprofit group. Uh, and so that makes me suspect that the electoral officer is just letting nonprofit groups voluntarily decide whether or not they want to register and disclose. This is something public interest Alberta is going to have to monitor. You know, uh, take a close look in the next election, you know, note any of the camp outside campaign ads that you see on TV and match it up with the filings. Of course, it's going to take you six months after the election to match it up, but match it up with the filings and, and see if all these outside groups are, in fact, registering and disclosing. That's a great point. Uh, hi there. My name is Amanda Frysett. I'm a union rep. Thank you. Um, so I am both a registered lobbyist and uh, I've worked in the shadowy groups or super PACs. Um, uh, one, so one of the few lobbyists who will actually declare herself a lobbyist. I'm proud of you. Um, I have to. It's on a piece of paper somewhere that everybody gets to look at. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on two things. Uh, first, the uh, vilification that uh, progressive groups such as unions receive when they uh, advertise or lobby, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and how, you know, somehow that's okay for corporations, but not okay for us. Uh, and also, I'm wondering if you might comment on some of the privacy implications of that. Uh, certainly, as a, I'm a registered federal lobbyist, so certainly there are some uh, privacy issues there as well. So I'm wondering if you could just uh, tell me what you think about that. Sure. That, I mean, that raises some interesting questions, which, which, you know, I'm in the middle of some controversies in the U.S. You know, I, I not only helped draft the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, but I did so with uh, then Senator Barack Obama, uh, who later became president. Uh, you know, Barack Obama is a firm believer in many of the ethics and lobby laws. Of all the problems I have with him on everything else, when it comes to lobbying and ethics laws, you know, he really does believe in that. Let me back up a little bit to give you a little bit of history about the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act. You know, I, when I started lobbying at Public Citizen, I was so frustrated at not being able to get much done because lobbying, the effective lobbying, was done by corporate lobbyists who have a great deal of money, the Jack Abramoffs, you know, the K Street lobbyists, who could pay for whining and dining and gifts and sporting events for members of Congress and fly them to Scotland to play golf. Stuff I could never do because I don't have money, you know? And so it was a very un uneven playing field, and I was losing. So I drafted uh, a version of LOGA, the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, to ban gifts, ban whining and dining, restrict travel paid for by lobbyists or private groups, and got some friends to introduce the bill in the Senate and the House, but it was going nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. You know, Congress wasn't interested. And I'd be knocking on doors, trying to get co-sponsors and making phone calls, and no one would even return my phone calls. And then in January 2006, Jack Abramoff, the corrupt lobbyist, got caught up in a sting operation uh, where he plea bargained with the Department of Justice, agreeing that he would point the finger at every member of Congress whom he bribed. And when that became news, I didn't even have to leave my office. My phone started ringing off the hook as members are calling me saying, hey, can we sign on to that reform legislation? 
And within a year, it became law. Then Obama uh, went to the White House, and he carried with him many of the lobbyist requirements that we couldn't get into LOGA, and you know, namely a reverse revolving door policy that would prohibit someone from being appointed to a presidential position if they had lobbied that office within the last two years. Now this has especially raised you know, anger among K Street lobbyists, because you know, they call it the scarlet L that they're being forced to wear. But at the same time, you know, there were some nonprofit lobbyists that have been denied appointments as well. And so some in the nonprofit sector are angry. Quite frankly, I've always wanted to be appointed to the Federal Election Commission. But, you know, because of essentially my own ethics rules, I just wrote myself right out of that job. <laughs> but that's okay, you know. Uh, quite frankly, most of the appointees, 99% of them, are corporate entities, corporate people anyway. The nonprofit appointees are, are very small in number. If we have to give up five appointees in order to make sure that, you know, a thousand other corporate lobbyists don't get appointed, that's okay with me. Uh, by the way, on the privacy issue then, you know, the profession of lobbying is a unique profession. It's really not a private sector position. It is, but not really. Our whole purpose, our whole business, is to influence the public sector. No other private sector job can make that claim. So as a lobbyist, we're uniquely right in the middle between the private and the public sector. And because of that, we ought to be subject to the exact same disclosure requirements that we subject public officials to, because that's our purpose. Uh, so, you know, I understand privacy concerns, but as a lobbyist, we are a unique profession, and we should recognize that as such, we need to be fully transparent as to what it is we're doing. Uh, yeah, just a comment and a question, I guess. Many years ago, Ralph Nader uh, came here when we were rallying around privatization of healthcare, and he gave us that message as well. You've got to follow the money. I think it's also important that we follow and understand who the people, people are. Uh, as you were speaking, it came to, to me, uh, thought about the, the Koch brothers. And when I looked it up on the um, internet, there's a story posted yesterday about the Koch brothers funding uh, what appears to be an efforts in Tennessee to repeal state income tax. Um, I had then Googled Koch brothers in Alberta, and the story that comes up posted uh, in March of this year, March 21st, that the Koch brothers quietly became become largest tar sand leaseholders in Alberta. Right? Yes, I'm aware so, of that. Who are these people and what do they stand for? And I think an important part of uh, our actions need to be following the money and connecting the dots in terms of the money. But I think it's really important that we also start naming and, and, and profiling uh, these people behind the money as well. I, I do not disagree with that at all. I mean, I didn't mean to say you shouldn't name the individuals who are lobbying or making campaign contributions. I meant to emphasize that you have to, have to follow the money, have to show the money. And that's the main weakness that I see in the Alberta disclosure laws is there's no money. You know, furthermore, not only do you need to name the Koch brothers, but you also need, need to name all the individuals involved in the Coke industries. And the only way to know if they're involved in the Coke industries is if you include their occupation and employer as part of the disclosure along with the list of names. Otherwise, it's just a list of names. Hi, my name's Noel Somerville. I'm with uh, Publicans of Alberta Seniors Task Force. Uh, you know, the names, the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson have become almost household words in Canada. <laughs> and they don't seem to care. Who knows who they are and who they give the money to. 
you used to have a public financing of campaigning in the United States. And I think it was actually President Obama who decided to opt out of that to take others' money to campaign with. What is the future of publicly financed campaigning in the United States? Wow. You've just asked a question that encompasses all my work over the last several years here. Uh, you know, as I explained earlier, uh, to me, transparency is the floor upon which the rest of the house is built. And the rest of the house is contribution limits, spending limits, public financing of campaigns. But first, you have to have that floor in place of transparency. And because of those five justices on the Supreme Courts, we have not only lost most of our contribution limits, uh, we have, and spending limits, we have now even lost much of our transparency. You know, when I began working as a lobbyist on campaign finance issues, I didn't even really care that much about transparency. I just, you know, assumed, okay, that's good. Yeah, of course, but we gotta get the real, real reforms of public financing in place. These days, I am scrambling just to get that floor back. And I've gotta get that floor back before I can start before I can start really seriously working on public financing. I am working on public financing and contribution limits and spending limits all at the same time, but until I can get that floor of transparency, I don't stand a chance getting the rest of the house built. However, you know, I'm going to keep it on the agenda and I'm gonna keep talking about it and keep educating you know, Americans and, and everyone I talk to about the importance of public financing. And, and public financing, by the way, I do wanna emphasize, is really the best solution. I mean, that's the solution that removes that private special interest money out of politics altogether. You know, so suddenly the money is no longer tied to a government contract or to a tax break or to any other public policy. Uh, so public financing is, is the best solution. But in the U.S., I've got to get that floor back in place before I can seriously start working on these other issues. I'm going to keep them on the agenda and keep talking about it, and hopefully soon I'll be able to pick up that battle again. Just wondering if you could tell us who Citizens United was exactly, or is. <laughs> you know, interesting little case. I mean, uh, Public Citizen was involved in the litigation as well. Citizens United actually is a nonprofit organization. And they, you know, they're a very hardcore Republican nonprofit group. And they produced a movie called Hillary the Movie. You know, the movie was absolutely absurd. I mean, all it was was calling Hillary a European socialist, you know, just every bad name. Uh, you know, the whole movie was interviews with talking heads slamming Hillary Clinton. I mean, clearly, what uh, Citizens United thought that Hillary would be the Democratic nominee in 2008. So they produced this ad for that purpose, to attack her, which is fine. I mean, they, they have a right to do that. However, then they decided they not only want to attack Hillary, they want to attack the campaign finance law. So even though they're a nonprofit, and they could have aired this movie and the ads supporting the movie uh, with their own money and not violate the campaign finance law, they went out and asked a corporation to give them some money to help pay for it, unnecessarily, just for the purpose of challenging our corporate ban on contributions to political committees. So they went out and they fabricated a case that really didn't exist, and just to challenge the campaign finance law. And then that became the Citizens United versus FEC decision. And by the way, they weren't even challenging the entire campaign finance law. They were just challenging a small provision of the McCain-Feingold law, not actually the entire corporate ban of federal elections, just a small provision of McCain-Feingold. 
And the ruling, the initial ruling, came out in the summer of 2009, where the five justices on the Supreme Court said, you know, we don't even want to decide this case. This is what the five justices said. We want to pick up a bigger challenge to the entire corporate ban on campaign financing. So it's those five justices that made the Citizens United case. Citizens United never even asked for this. Uh, they made it, and then they ordered us and all the parties involved in the case to, we've got another 30 days to write new briefs addressing whether the entire corporate ban on financing elections is constitutional. So they turned a little case into a big monumental case, and they did it entirely on their own. Citizens United is a group that still exists. Uh, quite frankly, they're a nonprofit organization, but uh, you know, they're not particularly noteworthy. What made the Citizens United name noteworthy were the five justices. Fascinating. We have uh, time for two more. We've got about four minutes left, so um, go right ahead with yeah. two more, please. Um, John Wodak. Um, I want to recall uh, an incident in the, uh, during the hearings on the Alberta Lobbyist Act, and they were getting bogged down in deciding just who was a lobbyist and how were they going to define them for the purposes of the Act. Uh, the suggestion was made that instead of defining a lobbyist, um, we could simply require all the public officials to report who'd been lobbying them. And I'd like your comment on whether that would fly. That's not a question, that's a statement, right? No, I, what do you think of it? Uh, well. Re requiring disclosure by the public officials. Yeah. Uh, you know, in order to squarely address the whole lobby issue, you've got to come out with a very empirical, objective, standard, and definition of lobbyists. You've got to remove any kind of subjectivity when it comes to the definition of lobbyists, or else lobbyists are going to exploit that and claim, you know, well, you know, that's not really my principal purpose, for instance. You need these subjective standards. By the way, the subjective standards that were drafted under the Lobby Disclosure Act of 1995 was by a guy named Peter Levine. You know, I, I know this guy. And he understood the problems of having a subjective standard, and he's the one who came up with these specific numerical uh, standards that once you pass that threshold, you have to register. And it's, it's been a phenomenal success at this point. We do need to strengthen the lobby disclosure requirements and definition of lobbyists because since Obama and LOGA have started adding ethics requirements on lobbyists, many lobbyists in the U.S. have decided, okay, I'm not going to register, you know, and so because I don't want to be banned from government service and appointment. So we've seen a slight decline, a modest decline in lobbyist registrations in the U.S. Uh, so we need to revisit that definition in the U.S. as well to make sure we capture that. I hope that answered your question. 